Amen. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to everyone. We're so glad. I'm thankful for my mom and all of you moms and grandmoms and, and step-in moms and, and all the moms. Uh, because, you know, I look back and, and uh, boy, I'm thankful that I was rescued out of a bunch of stuff. Uh, because uh, I know that my mom prayed in many ways. And uh, I know y'all are praying. And so if I could just tell you one thing, keep praying. Keep praying because probably many of us are here today because of praying moms and grandmoms. Isn't that the truth? That is the truth. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 today. We're continuing our series uh, called Crazy Church. All right? Crazy Church. Today we're going to be talking about the divided church. Last week we began the book of 1 Corinthians and we looked at reorienting the church. Paul was writing to the church there at Corinth. They had problem after problem after problem. And so he, is, he has been told all these problems, and he's writing them a letter to help them understand what they needed to do. And so he began in the first place and the only place that he should have begun. And he began speaking about reorienting the church back to him. He reminded them of who they were, who the church is. Right? He began to, to tell them about the blessings that the church has just because of Jesus. And then the, the promises for the church, how the Lord provides endless strength, endless strength and his faithfulness at all times. The Lord will never leave us or forsake us. He is always taking care of us. How we never need to doubt whether or not he is with us because he is faithful. Well, he begins, as we open the, the word this week, he begins to, to address the problems in the church title of the message today is The Divided Church. And I think you moms and grandmoms would understand this message very well, right? Because it is about people fussing and fighting. Anybody, parent, mom, anybody had kids that fussed and, and fought? Anybody have kids that would gang up on each other? It's amazing that many of us grew to adulthood, isn't it? But that's what's going on here. I mean, the church is fussing and fighting. They are having problems. They're divided. And Paul has to remind them what they need to understand in order to go forward. Right? Not only do kids fuss and fight in households, but adults fuss and fight. And they can, they can fuss and fight in church. And that's not the place to be doing it, right? So join me as we open the word today. And we're going to see what the, the cure is for the divided church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. Now, I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, that you be united with the same understanding and the same conviction, for it has been reported to me about you, my brothers, my, by members of Chloe's household, that there is rivalry among you. What I am saying is this. Each of you says, I'm with Paul, or I'm with Apollos, or I'm with Cephas, or I'm with Christ. Is Christ divided? Was it Paul who, cruci who was crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. I did, in fact, baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anyone else, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to evangelize, not with clever words, so that the cross of Christ will not be emptied of its effect. Paul had gotten a a report from the household of Chloe told him that you won't believe what's going on, Paul. See, Paul had planted the Corinthian church in Corinth. He stayed there for almost two years, over two years. And then he went to Ephesus because they ran him out of town. And so he is in Ephesus. He had planted the church there in Ephesus. And so he had people that were still in connection with him and they would come visit him in Ephesus. And, and so he is getting the news from one of the people from Corinth that you, after you left, Paul, you won't believe what happened. 
All these people are fighting. They're fighting and they're fussing and the church is divided. I mean, everything that you worked for is just, boy, it stinks right now. And so Paul had to address this. And he begins, and, and the first thing on your listening outline today is he begins with a plea for unity. Verse 10, he, and he's, he's taking this not as a, a mad parent. He's not taking this and addressing this as someone irritated. He's taking this as someone that has great compassion for the people. He's writing to them as a brother, and he calls them brothers here in, chapter, in verse 10 and verse 11. And he says, I urge you. That word urge is, is a little more, it's a little deeper. It's the, it's the idea of coming alongside, right? You have, a, you have a friend that's got a problem, and you go alongside of them, and you, you talk to them, and you walk with them, and you comfort them, and you strengthen them. That's the kind of idea that Paul is talking here. He says, I urge you, I am coming alongside of you. I, I do this because... Brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's, he's saying this is not in my name, this is not in anybody else's name, but the church is written in the name of Jesus Christ. No one else owns the church but Jesus. And I appeal to you and I urge you and I plead with you that in the name of the Lord Jesus that you agree in what you say. He's talking about not everybody agrees about the same things, but he says that you don't have this divisive language among you. That you don't fuss and fight. You're not always arguing with each other. He says, I want you to agree in the things that you, that you speak. Come to an agreement, right? Quit talking about each other and talk to each other. Quit accusing and attacking and having all of these problems, grumbling and griping and complaining. And he says, quit that. He says, come together and agree in what you say. Let your words strengthen the church and agree with each other. And he says that there be no divisions among you. The word division there is the word schism. Right? A split or a tearing apart. Literally, it means the ripping apart of, of clothing. Tearing a piece of cloth apart. He says, let there be no divisions among you. He's saying, within the church, you need to be together. This division that you're having is, is awful. And you see, that's the exact thing that the devil wants. The last thing that the devil wants is a united and a unified church that loves Jesus and loves each other. That's the last thing he wants. Because in, in, when you see a church like that, a church that loves Jesus and loves each other, then you see a church that is making impact on the people in their neighborhoods and in their communities. You see a church that is actually going forward and building the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of the devil. You see, he wants churches to be divided. But Paul says, I plead with you that you come together, right? You've got to be together. You've got to love one another. And he says, you need to be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. Here, he's talking about the, the understanding. He says, you need to, to be united in your thoughts and your reasonings and your affections. He says, you need to have not only just the same understanding, but the same conviction, that you have the same conclusions and the same goals. You have the same beliefs and the same objectives. Now, Paul is not telling them here uh, to be uniform. He's not telling them to all be the same. You see, there's a difference. To be uniform is, means you all dress the same way, you talk the same way, you do all that. And that's not what he's saying here. He said, in all of the differences between all the people. And remember, this is Corinth. Corinth had everything under the sun, right? Corinth was the was a hundred times worse than what we could imagine Vegas being today. It is one of those places that there was nothing that was out of the realm of possibility. And all of you people, all of the Corinthian church had come and they had put their faith in Christ. And now they had brought along some of their baggage with them. 
And they brought, and now they were seeing all of these problems that they had, and they're entering into the church. And Paul is saying, stop it. Stop it. Agree with one another. Love one another. Take care of one another. Jesus, in his prayer in John chapter 17, Jesus is about to be crucified. It is his last week on the earth as a human. And he begins to pray in chapter 17 for the disciples, and then he prays for the church, which is us. And this prayer that Jesus prays is a prayer not for all of these majestic things, but the main gist of the prayer is this, verse 20 and 21 of John chapter 17. He says, I pray not only for these, the disciples before him, but also for those who believe in me through their message. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in, I am in you. May they also be one in us so that the world may believe you sent me. Jesus is saying of all the prayers, Jesus is praying for the church is that we be one. Everybody join together with the same, the same purpose, the same ideas. We don't all think the same way and praise the Lord for that because it is the variety and the differences within the church that help us be the church. That is the beauty of the whole variety of each one of us. Look around. We are all different. We all have beliefs and we all have things, but you see, we are joined in common by Christ. We are joined in common by his word and what it tells us and how he leads us in his word. We are joined in that. And he says, don't be divided. He said, be united. I love Peanuts comic strips. I mean, they, Charles Schultz, I think, was a great theologian. He was, wrote one comic strip, and, and you see the first, the first uh, square is Linus. He's sitting there watching the television with his blanket. And then the next scene you see, here comes Lucy, his bully sister. And she said, Linus, turn the television over to what I want to watch. He looks at her and he says, well, what makes you think you have the right to come in here and tell me what to do? She said, you see these five fingers? She said, when they are united, they are powerful. <laughs> the next square, Linus is shaking his head. What do you want to watch? He turns the channel and the last square has Linus looking at his hand saying, why can't you guys get organized like that? <laughs> you see, the church was birthed in the blood of Christ. We are called to be a weapon in this world for righteousness. Amen. We are called to be the bearers of light in a dark world. We are called to be the ones who give love in a world that doesn't even know what love is. We are called to be the people of God that live completely differently in a world that has gone insane. But we can only do that if we are united. The united church is powerful. The divided church is weak and is overcome by the darkness. Paul goes on and he helps us understand what the problem is, what the biggest problem they're experiencing. And you see in the next verses, the second thing is the problem of preference. The problem of preference. Verse 11, it has been reported to me about you, my brothers, by members of Chloe's household, that there is rivalry among you. What I'm saying is this, each of you says, well, I'm with Paul, or I'm with Apollos, or I'm with Cephas, or I'm with Christ. Paul is pointing to the fact that they have become cliquish. They have become a, a bunch of different people following a bunch of different people. He is telling them that there is no reason for this. this they have, they've got these preferences. One says, well, I like Paul better. He started the church. I'm following him. And, and some say, well, I like Apollos. Apollos was one who had... He was a great orator. 
Paul, they say, according to the scriptures, Paul was not a very, uh, a very good speaker. He was brilliant, but he was not a very good speaker. Apollos, on the other hand, Apollos was a fairly new convert. He came to know the Lord, and he could speak. He was just like the Corinthians and the Greeks of that time. He was a beautiful orator, but he didn't have a lot of wisdom and knowledge in the Word. And then it says, well, we follow Cephas. That's Peter. Peter was a celebrity, if you will, back then. You know, if Peter would come and he would visit the churches, we have reason to believe that he went to Corinth and visited the church. And so they said, well, you know, I'm, I'm with Cephas. I'm with Peter. I mean, he's the one that preached that first message and all those people got saved. And then you see the other ones and it says, well, I'm with Christ. Now, I don't believe these are the people that are trying to do the right thing. I believe these are the people that, that are trying to be self-righteous. The Pharisees among the group. Well, you can follow them. I'm just going to follow Jesus. Right? And if you went to each service, you would imagine that like they were wearing their favorite jerseys of the favorite people. Some had Paul's jersey on and some had Peter's and some had Apollo's. And, and Paul's like, this has got to stop. Right? There's no reason that personal preference has any purpose in the church. Preferences can destroy churches. You just look at, and I've known, I tell you, I've known churches that have split and died over arguments over the color of the carpet that they were going to do. Knew of a church that had water damage in their sanctuary. So they had to get new carpet. It had been about a color like this, and they were going to put in some new carpet, and they decided, a lot of people that were wanting to, let's do it in blue this time. Well, okay, let's do it in blue. And then a whole other half of the church says, no, we need to go back and do it the exact same way we had it before. And, and so it became such a problem that that church actually divided over their arguments over the color of the carpet. No, of a, I know of a, of a worship pastor that got fired because he moved the piano from one side of the stage to the other. I'm not joking. You think I didn't make this up. It's awful what people in church can do to each other if they are focused on their own preference as opposed to focusing on Jesus. Unfortunately, I know exactly what Paul's talking about here. Charlotte and I, after we graduated from seminary, went to a church in Royce City, Texas, our first church to pastor. When we was in the interview process, I talked to one of the people in their town and that knew them, the director of missions, and he told me straight up, he said, Dal, you better make sure that God's calling you to that church because it is a hornet's nest. And I was like, yay, we don't have to go. But Charlotte and I made a pact that we'll always pray and ask the Lord. So we did, and to our both of our demise and disappointment, we got called to that church. We went into that church, and there was a man that was the youth and music pastor. He had been in that church for a long time. He had his parents in that church. He had his sister-in-laws in that church. He had all of his family in that church. He had his people that he grew up with in high school in that church. And I came in, and we were outsiders. The thing, he wanted to be the pastor before I was actually called to be the pastor. And him and his family and all of his family thought that he should be the pastor and that I shouldn't be the pastor. So I come in to a divided church. Everything he did was wonderful. Everything I did was not so wonderful. I would time it every Monday. I would either have a handwritten letter or an email in my office on Monday morning telling me how awful a preacher I am. How, boy, you messed that passage up. You need to think of it this way. And then I had people during the sermon yelling at me. Not saying amen. <laughs> it was a church that was divided. But the Lord used it. The, the Lord used it powerfully in my life. Because I realized that I had no power to put that back together. It ended up leading to a split. 
I took that church in all of its glory from about 120 down to about 50. That was the growth strategy that year. But you see, the Lord did a great thing after that because guess what? All of us that were left were united in one thing and in Jesus. And, and I've told this story when we were talking about our church, paying off the church. That was the first time I got to see the Lord's hand really move. It had been about six or eight months since the split had happened. We were, we, uh, we were staying together as a church and, and seeking the Lord. And one of our senior adults came up to me and put his arm around me. He says, Pastor, he said, I, you're doing the right thing. He said, I didn't like those people anyway. He said, they were all in it for themselves and not for Jesus. And then the next thing he said was, hey, how much do we owe on our mortgage and our land? And I said, $176,000. He looked at me and I looked at him and I said, okay. He says, I'm going to pay that. I said, no, Joe, $176,000. Joe had flown uh, bombers in, in World War II. And Joe said, no, no, I heard you. He said, where do we bank? He said, I'll meet you there tomorrow at 1 o'clock, Monday. We met at the banker, told the banker what we were wanting to do. The banker was completely flummoxed. He's getting the paperwork ready, and Joe leans over to him, and he says, okay, it's 176. He said, you mind if I just write the check for 200000 I said, no. <laughs> Go ahead and write it. I said, I just want to hold it. Because I've never held a check for that much that would actually go through. <laughs> After that division was taken out of the church, there was a beautiful peace. We saw people come to know the Lord. We saw some really great things happen. But it took that division to be taken care of by the Lord. Charlotte and I are so thankful to be here because we are a unified church. And I'll tell you, it's almost been 13 years. I've not gotten one nasty email. Not one. Don't you write me one, Miss Nancy. We have been blessed because y'all love us. Y'all love each other. Do we fuss? Yeah, we fuss. But you know what we do about it? We talk about it. We pray about it. And we handle it the way that God would have us to handle it. You see, we're an imperfect church. And I'll tell you that. We're not the perfect church. If you're looking for a perfect church, keep looking. You won't find it. But you see, we love the Lord. And he loves us. And then we love each other. Paul was talking against the divided church. There is a problem with preference. When we start demanding our own preferences instead of what Christ would have us do. He goes on. The next thing he wanted them to do, he wanted them right back to Jesus. Right back to Jesus. Verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was it Paul who was crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? Hmm. He said, I thank God that I baptized no one except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. I did, in fact, baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. Paul is pointing them right back to Jesus. He said, you can have all your preferences that you want to. He said, I didn't die on the cross for you. And I'll tell you that Jared didn't die on the cross for you. I didn't die on the cross for you. Todd didn't die on the cross for you. We are men, people. We are not your savior. We are blessed to be your pastors. But he points them right back to the only one that can heal the division. And that is Jesus. You see, these cliques, these divisions that they had always get out of control. People will, will fight for their, their preference, whatever or whoever it is, and it will always divide the church, and it's never anything healthy. 
He said, is Christ divided? No, he's not divided. Christ is one. He died on the cross for us. His sacrifice on the cross was everything we need to be remembered. And he is the one that leads the church. I am not the leader of this church. We are not the leaders of this. Jesus is the leader of this church. If we can keep that in mind, then the church can do some damage against the darkness of the world. If we remember who's in control, Christ is not divided. He is together and he is just as powerful now as he was then. Christ can't be divided. We as his children are to be together not in these cliques. You see, cliques make people followers of men. Followers of humans. And you should never follow humans. I don't know if you keep up with the news, but there is a whole lot of problems and a whole lot of churches all over the place. I mean, there have been pastors that have been fired like crazy. And, and most of them deserved it, if you just read the stories. There's a huge church in Jacksonville where the pastor was fired, and the church found out that he was, he was buying real estate and mansions under the name of the church. And he's suing the church, and they're suing him, and it's a mess. It's a mess. They followed the man. And that, that you can just see, um, unfortunately, you can just look on the internet and look at news sites and they're, they're everywhere. Well, you can always tell in those places like that, that that is a man-centered place and not a God-centered place. Simple as that. When you see these problems pop up and it becomes cliquish and you see all these divisions, you see that those people have, have not been focused upon the one true God. You see, I pray all the time for, for Jared and myself and for Todd that the Lord keeps us strong. Because you know what? Peter reminds us that, hey, you don't glory over the people who have fallen because you're just one step away. You're one step away. And I have to ask the Lord every day, Lord, keep me from doing something stupid. And I pray it that way. Lord, help me to be a great... A great husband and a great father and a great pastor and a person that walks with you. Because, Lord, in, in my own strength, if I try to do all that in my strength, I'm a failure. A failure. The last thing I want to do is fail my wife and my kids and my church family. But that keeps me on my knees. But you see, as one old deacon told me in that previous church, he said, you know, if the devil... Doesn't use me to be a problem in the church. He'll use you. If he doesn't use you to be in the problem in the church. He'll use you. And so it's not just the pastors that have to pray. About the Lord's protection upon us. It is all of us. That have to pray. That the Lord would keep us focused on him. And that we would walk forward. And we wouldn't be the stumbling block. Or the problem in the church. That causes the church to, to stumble. And not be of any consequence in a world that is in so much of a need of people that know Christ. You see, that's what we all have to do. And the Lord will use you powerfully. But if you're not careful, the devil will use you too to, mark, to take people away from the Lord instead of towards him. You see, the problem is those awful things that are happening in those churches, that makes big news. It makes headlines, Right? You never see all of the headlines. You never see the big stories about the churches that are following Jesus, do you? There's no big news story about us paying off the mortgage. No big news story. All right, there's no big news story of, of us comforting one another in the midst of loss. There's no, nobody, no reporters came and asked me about that. And all of the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of churches across America and the world that are faithful to Jesus, they love each other, and they are consistently doing what they need to do. We don't see news stories about them. The devil doesn't want to advertise that. 
He wants to cause problems and divisions so that that gets the news. And, and everybody looks at that. Well, I know those churches are rotten anyway. All those pastors just want power and money and, you know, all this stuff. And, and that's the way that the devil wants everybody to think about the church. But that is not what Christ has for us. We are to be the ones pointing directly to Christ. The last thing that he reminds the church here is that there is a power of having a purpose. It's the power of the purpose. He says in verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to evangelize, not with clever words, so that the cross of Christ will not be emptied of its effect. He says, I didn't come to you to baptize everybody. I came to you to lead people to Christ. And that's what the church, that's our purpose. You see the Great Commission at the end of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus' last words to the disciples. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and, and, and teaching them all that I have given you and I will be with you even until the end of the age. He gives them the marching orders. A church that doesn't know what their purpose is, they're all going to be pulling in different directions, getting nowhere. But a church that understands what we're for has the same purpose has the same mind about things, has the same agreement in what we believe, has the same hope and the same dreams. We all have the same Savior. We all have been saved from our sins. Not because we deserve it, but because we have a God that's full of grace and mercy and loves us immensely. Not one of us in the church deserve to be saved. And that's where the gratitude comes. Lord, boy, you knew what I used to be and you saved me anyway. Thank you. But he wanted to remember. He wanted them to remember the purpose of the church. That's our purpose. To make disciples means, first of all, you've got to take the ones that, that have not known the Lord, share the gospel with them, and they can put their faith in the Lord and become Christians. You see, that's the truth of the matter. Not everybody is born a Christian. Right? People aren't born Christians. You have to become a Christian. Right? You don't, you're not a Christian because your parents were or your family is. You are only a Christian when you put your faith, yourself, in Jesus. You ask the Lord for forgiveness for your sin. You trust in Him as your Savior. You give yourself to Him. And that's when he saves you. But that's not where it ends. Paul says not only to, to make disciples and to baptize them, but to teach them everything that, I basically, that he basically taught them. Discipleship begins with evangelism, but it continues with discipleship. It means that we gather together and we listen to the preaching of the word. We gather for small groups and we open the, the word and we study it together. We pray for one another. We're not Lone Ranger Christians, right? We are Christians that walk alongside of each other. That's the way it's supposed to be. The world is antagonistic against Christians, if you haven't noticed. You can have a conversation about Buddha. You can have a conversation about Islam and people will be so happy. But you bring up the name of Jesus. Something's about to happen. That just leads to another reason why Jesus is the one true God. You see, we've got to be people that are focused and we're pulling all in the same direction now what are we what are we doing he says well you not only he said to evangelize not with clever words so that the cross of Christ will not be emptied of its effect Paul is saying here he's saying I didn't come to you with clever words like Apollos did I didn't come with great speaking skills I didn't say all of these fancy words and all of this stuff he didn't I didn't he said it was just the power of the cross that changes everything That's it. 
It doesn't take all kinds of fancy shenanigans. It doesn't take all these things. It said it takes the cross of Christ. And we depend upon the cross of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, lived on this earth perfectly. He was born of a virgin. He died on the cross and he took our sins upon him while he was hanging on the cross and it killed him. And they buried him in a, in a, in a borrowed tomb and on the third day he was resurrected back to life. That is the gospel. That is what people need in their lives. It is the power of God to salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, I can tell you all kinds of wonderful things to do in your life. I can give you 10 points on, on being a better person and being a better mama and being a better daddy and being a better kid and, and how to get out of this and how to get into this. And, and you see, those things are okay, but if I tell you that without telling you about the gospel, then I'm no better than a Pharisee piling on your shoulders a bunch of great things that you can do that you don't have the strength to do yourself. You see, Paul wants them to be focused, wants us to be focused on the cross. He's pointing them back to the purpose of the church. That's why we're here. We're not just to be here and just to love each other and all that. That's great. We are supposed to do that. But our focus is to love each other and go out and reach those people who don't have any love. I mean, you saw the, 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 the video we played for one child, one more child, our Florida Baptist Children's Home. Man, that's a great ministry. They will help kids out and take kids out of awful situations. They have rescued kids out of, out of sex trafficking and all these things. But you see, they're making a difference. They're showing love to those that have never been loved. You see, what's so crazy is that there are more people around us than we realize that have never experienced real love. It's extraordinary. I talk to people consistently that tell me how they were never loved by their, by their parents. They never experienced love in life. They just kind of went from one relationship to the next, to the next, to the next, thinking that that was love and that was not love. You see, what the world calls love is not love. It is hollow. It is a feeling. It's an emotion that will quickly go away after its honeymoon period. You see, the love that Christ has for us is a love that is faithful. A love that won't go away when we disappoint him. A love that says, what have you done for me lately? He, that's not the kind of love that Jesus gives us. He gives us a love that is based upon himself. I'm so thankful for the cross of Christ that because of his great love for us, Christ died for us while we were still yet sinners. Wow. Let me just tell you today, you cannot clean yourself up. You think you're waiting to come to know Christ? You say, well, I'll just... I'll, I've got to get some things taken care of in my life, and then I'll come to Christ. Nope, not going to happen. You're going to be trying to change that stuff for the rest of your life, and you're going to miss out on Jesus. You think, well, you know, maybe I need to do this, and maybe I need, and then I'll come to know Christ. No. There's no need to wait. Christ is here now. And he is ready to take all of the baggage, all of the sin all of the stuff that you have done all of your life, and to forgive you completely. A forgiveness that cost him his life. A forgiveness that, that actually removes all of our sin. He'll never remind you again what you did before. Because the word tells us that he, he casts our sin behind his back. He removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. That means never, ever again will he remind you, hey, remember when you did that? No. He doesn't. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you today. If you don't know the Lord yet, if you've not put your faith in him and been washed clean of all those things that you can't fix yourself, Jesus is the answer.
Maybe you're a believer here today and you have forgotten that. As believers, we can get beat up by the world. We can start believing all of the stuff that the devil's whispering in our ears. And we think, oh, I can't come back to Christ. All these things that I did. And all you have to do is come back and they're gone. That's it. Sometimes as Christians, we would rather live in the pig pen than come back to the Father. It's a choice today. Are you going to follow Jesus? Are you going to be united with Christ? Because if you're not a believer, you are divided from Christ. What's the choice today? What is it that we need more than anything? It is not fancy words. It is the gospel of Jesus. It is Jesus himself. We think that there is all these benefits and we have the idea of benefits and all these things. But you see, the benefit of coming to know Christ is Christ. Everything is found in him. Grace, forgiveness, mercy, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, joy, happiness. All of the things that people are searching for are only found in Christ. And I invite you to come to know him today. I invite you as a believer to be reminded. Be reminded that it is about Jesus. Your life is not about you. It's about him. How he can use you for every breath to give him glory and to do things with you that you don't even, you can't even imagine how wonderful they'll be. Because that's what he does.